Okay, we're going to get started. Um, there are a lot of people registered for this um, workshop this morning, so hopefully folks will have a chance to join soon. I'm going to just, okay, um, folks will have a chance to join, um, but we are going to get started because we have a pretty full program this morning, and I want to give Russ plenty of time to um, get to all of the important information that he's developed for our workshop this morning. So where today's workshop is understanding residential heat pumps for heating and cooling. This is part two. We presented part one in the fall. If you're interested in look, uh, seeing the recording of the workshop that we presented in the fall, the part one workshop, please reach out to our office and um, the contact information will be provided in the slide deck. Um, so reach out to our office and we can send you the link to the um, recording and the presentation slides. Um, you, everyone will, after who's, work, who's registered for this workshop, will receive the link to this recording and also the presentation slides about a week after the workshop to give us time to edit the, the recording and um, just provide you guys with the link. If you don't receive the link or the email with the links um, within about a week, please reach out to our office and um, just check, or first check your spam um, folder, any junk email folders that you have, and make sure that it's not just going to, going to spam, and then reach out to our office and we'll um, set you up to get a link to the previous workshop. So welcome, my name's Christine Condon. I'm an energy and sustainability analyst with the County of Sonoma, the Climate Action and Resiliency Division. I've been with the division since 2017. Prior to joining the county, I worked as an energy and green building consultant in the private sector. And before that, I was a program engineer for PG&E. Um, we are so fortunate this morning to welcome back Russ King for today's workshop. Russ is a licensed mechanical engineer with over 30 years of experience practicing and teaching residential HD, HVAC design, energy codes, energy ratings, and building science. And he can tell you a little about a little more about his background when he's, he begins. So a little bit of um, Zoom info here. Um, everyone's muted. Um, please enter questions into the chat. We will only be reviewing the chat for questions, so please stick to the chat. Um, and we'll address questions at the end of the presentation. So um, if there's anything that we're not able to address in the presentation, we'll follow up with, with uh, folks. Um, so that's, that's it for Zoom. Um, I just wanted to give a little background on the County of Sonoma's Energy and Sustainability Division, which recently merged with the Climate Action and Resiliency Division at the county. Um, so uh, we, um, are, the Energy and Sustainability Division has been in place since tw uh, 2006, um, and it was created to address internal county energy use in order to mitigate climate change through greenhouse gas reduction. And in 2009, our first community facing program was int introduced, the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, also known as Skype. Skype was the first and is the longest running residential property assessed clean energy financing program. The program allows property owners to finance energy and water saving improvements as a tool in reducing greenhouse gases. Um, the program has been expanded to include commercial projects in Sonoma County, and to also include wildfire safety and seismic strengthening improvements. So we offer a number of services to the, to the Sonoma County community. We work with cities and towns and special districts, businesses and residents to increase energy efficiency in their buildings through um, audits, energy retrofit projects, rebates and financing. We provide consultation services at no cost to provide impartial information to educate community members so they can make informed decisions related to building improvements. And we offer project planning services to help identify resources such as incentives, rebates, and financing to get projects done. 
We host num numerous workshops and trainings for the community and for workforce development. And we also partner with a variety of agencies in the community to offer a robust pro portfolio of programs, resources, and services. Um, I've included a slide to the links um, to our winter workshops, and this is also where you'll find the contact information for the um, division. Um, you can phone or email to request um, the links to previous, slot, previous workshops, including the fall heat pump um, workshop that we presented part one. Um, and everyone who's registered online here for this workshop, again, will receive a link to the recording and presentation slides. So I wanted to go over a couple of resources that are available for um, uh, retrofitting to heat pump technology. Um, there's a great tool called the Switches On where you can go for more information on electrification in general, including heat pumps. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 um, has some fantastic incentives being rolled out at the state level towards the end of 2023. We expect to see those. And then there are tax credits available now for um, decarbonization technologies and solar and storage. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these rebates and financing programs, but I did think it was important to include the slides. So um, our previous workshop, Funding Your Projects, has all the details about these programs, a, real, um, a lot more detail. So if you're interested in learning more, please reach out and request that workshop and those slides. But these, again, these slides will be included when we send the um, materials to you. Here are some great links for understanding more about the Inflation Reduction Act potential. Um, and then we have always we've got the Bay Area Regional Energy Network that provides incentives for the nine Bay Area counties. Um, this is a, uh, a, a group of nine, nine counties um, that the CPUC authorizes um, rate pay, which authorized to provide um, rebate programs funded by um, the public purpose charge on your utility bill. So this is just one funding source for folks in Sonoma County. Um, lots of different incentives, looking at reducing your building loads before you electrify, lots of decarbonization opportunities with these incentives. Um, for Bayren, you have to use a participating contractor. They have a very robust contractor database that you can search by specialty. Um, this is just one slide that shows um, HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, um, and water heating incentives that are available right now in 2023. Um, and you can reach out to Bayron directly for more information about eligibility and what rebates are available. Sonoma Clean Power is another great partner that offers incentives for decarbonization or electric technologies, including heat pumps. They have a great advanced energy center downtown Santa Rosa across from the library, the Central Library on 4th Street. I recommend checking it out. It's a great way to learn about new technologies. This is a slide that shows their incentive levels right now. And they are, if you're eligible for the Bayron incentives and you're eligible for the Sonoma Clean Power incentives, they can actually be combined or stacked together. So it's a pretty uh, powerful group of incentives. They also have a 0% financing program that you can learn more about from them. Um, this is a slide just on the 0% financing program. Um, and we also have the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, where this is a property assessed clean energy financing program that I talked about. And please uh, check out the website, really comprehensive information about the program, and you can reach out to our office for more information. Here are some of the eligible improvements I talked about. And contact information. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my slide and turn it over to my friend Russ. If I can get this. How does that look? It looks good to me. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, so nice to be here to present this information to you. I'm glad you could all make it and glad you're all taking time out of your day to, to learn more about heat pumps. Um, I'm actually sitting in the corner of a um, of the uh, guest lounge at the beautiful Rush Creek Lodge right outside the gate of Yosemite. I'm up here for a, um, a conference. It's 
it's a home performance conference and one of the hottest topics right now is is heat pump so it's very appropriate for me to be here to, to teach this to you today um so um the agenda for today uh there'll be an introduction and then we'll go through some terminology that's important to understanding heat pumps and how they work uh, and then we'll have a really, I call it the super basic thermodynamics, uh, and the, we'll talk about the refrigeration cycle and how that works. And that's always a, a challenge to uh, explain to people in, in simple terms. Um, and then we'll talk about the advantages of heat pumps for space heating. Um, and this class is, it is part two, it is somewhat similar to part one. Uh, part one was a more kind of a generic uh, discussion of heat pumps in general. We'll cover a lot of the same material, but today's focus is primarily for heating and cooling, space heating and cooling. Um, and then there'll be another class, I believe, uh, this time next Wednesday, um, covering uh, water heating. So we'll cover that in the next class. Uh, so today's all about space heating. We're going to talk about different types of heat pumps used for space heating. And we're going to talk about how to size them. That's that's very, very important with heat pumps, um, that you that you size the, the heat pump properly for the house. Um, and um, then hopefully, if, it, if everything goes well, uh, we'll have time left over at the end for some open Q&A. And then I'll, I'll also give you uh, my contact information. If you have any questions um, later on, I can certainly answer those uh, by email or, or however, okay? All right, so um, quick introduction first. Uh, again, my name is Russ King. I'm a licensed mechanical engineer in three, three different states. Um, my company is called Coded Energy. We're a developer of a 3D HVAC design software that does load calcs and duct design. I've been doing this for, for over 30 years. My first job out of college in 1988 was doing um, energy modeling and HVAC design. And so I've seen a, a lot of changes happen over, over, over the years, a lot of improvements, which is good. Um, there's my email address. I believe I'll give it to you again at the end. Um, I have a blog where I talk about HVAC related stuff and I, I try to kind of keep it um, homeowner oriented, um, but a, a, a lot of the people who read the blog are also HVAC contractors and, and things like that. Um, our website is, is called quickmodel.com. We have a YouTube channel that talks about HVAC design. Uh, and I also uh, wrote a book called HVAC 1.0, Introduction to Residential HVAC Systems. And most of the, um, the images used in this presentation actually come out of that book, okay? All right, so to really appreciate heat pumps um, and, and how they differ from other types of heating systems, you have to first understand how and why we heat our homes, okay? That sounds really basic. Um, obviously, the main reason is for comfort. And in some extreme climates, it's for health and safety. If it, you know, obviously, if it gets too cold or too hot, it can be a health and safety issue. Uh, but primarily, the reason we heat and cool our homes is to make the inside a different temperature than the outside to make it to maintain a comfortable temperature inside the house. Um, and it takes a lot of energy. And so it's very important that we do that in a way that's not wasting energy. We have to we have to. Um, uh, using too much energy has a lot of negative impacts on the environment and, and economy and things like that. So we want to do this as efficiently as possible. There's a lot of different ways to heat and cool a house, um, but we want to do it that uses as little energy as possible and has the lowest impact on the environment. Okay. So HVAC, by the way, stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We're primarily going to be talking about heating and air conditioning. That's heating and cooling a house. The main goal of an HVAC system is to maintain a constant temperature inside the house, okay? So as the outdoor temperature goes up and down and gets uncomfortable and, and too hot, too cold, we want the house to stay at a constant temperature. And that's the purpose of a heating HVAC system. In the winter, houses lose heat. There's heat inside the house. And in the winter, it, it escapes to the outside. And in the summer, the opposite is true. The, all the heat is on the outside and it comes in and we have to deal with that, okay? So to maintain a constant temperature in the winter, we put a heater on the house to replace the BTUs that are being lost. And in the summer, we put an air conditioner on the house to remove the BTUs that are coming in. So it's all about fighting that flow of heat that's either coming into the house or escaping from the house, okay? Buttons to work there. there we go. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the terminology that we're going to use today. Uh, first of all, you've probably all heard of a BTU. Well, what exactly is a BTU? BTU stands for British Thermal Unit, and it's a unit of heat. It's how we quantify heat, all right? And it just so happens that one BTU is about the same amount of heat that is stored in a wooden kitchen match. So when you take a match, you strike it, and you let it burn all the way down, you've just released one BTU of heat into the air. Okay, 
Now we describe heat uh, in the terms of movement. So we move it from one place to another and we have to um, sort of quantify that and we do it in BTUs per hour. So when you, when you see a rating on an air conditioner or a rating on a furnace, it's BTUs per hour. So it's how much heat can be moved in a certain period of time. Okay? And that's the common unit that we use. I forgot which buttons make the slide go forward. All right, and so in a lot of these diagrams, you'll see this little flying kitchen match, and that's essentially gonna represent a BTU and having it move from one place to the other, okay? So another term that we use a lot that kind of confuses people is we size air conditioners in a unit called tons. We say that's a three ton air conditioner, it's a four ton air conditioner. Well, it has nothing to do with the weight of the air conditioner. It's an old term, it's an old archaic term that we use, um, and it's because back in the day, before there was mechanical refrigeration, everything was cooled by ice and you would buy a ton of ice to keep a train car cold or something like that. Or you'd buy a ton of ice to keep vegetables cold. Um, and so it just so happens that a ton of ice has about, has the ability to cool at about 12,000 BTUs per hour. So we, we represent that unit of 12,000 BTUs per hour. We call that a ton of cooling. So when you say a two ton air conditioner, you take two times 12,000, and that means that that air conditioner puts out or has the capacity to cool at about 24,000 BTUs per hour. So it's just a kind of a weird unit that, that gets used. And we call that the nominal capacity. When, when manufacturers build and design air conditioners, they design them to be about certain increments of tonnage, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, and five tons. And, and so we just call it, it it's not exactly 24,000 BTUs, we just call it a two ton unit because it, it's about 24,000 BTUs. Now that's just the nominal capacity. There's another capacity that's even more important and that's the installed capacity. The actual cooling capacity of an air conditioner is different depending on where it's installed. So an air conditioner in Las Vegas will actually give you a lot less cooling than an air conditioner in say San Jose, okay? Because of the outdoor temperature. So installed capacity is very important to understand. Nominal capacity is just what we call it, right? So cooling load, that's an important number. You'll hear me say loads, heating loads, cooling loads, load calculations, things like that. Well, the load is, is how many BTUs are coming into the house. In the summer, BTUs are more concentrated outside. And so they're naturally gonna wanna come into the house, okay? So um, a cooling load is how many BTUs per hour are coming in that have to be removed. And it's, it's something that can actually be calculated on a house by looking at the windows and the walls and the floors and how much insulation there is and what direction the windows are facing and things like that. So it's a, it's a number that you can calculate to determine what the load is on a house in the summertime. And we call that cooling load. Similarly, um, oh, sorry for the cooling. When you, so when, when I say cooling, what does that mean? So a lot of people think cooling is putting coldness into a house. It's not, it's actually removing the BTUs inside the house so that it cools the house. So consider an air conditioner that's tested by the manufacturer to have a cooling capacity of 24,000 BTUs, okay? About a two ton air conditioner. What that means is it has the ability to remove 24,000 kitchen batches worth of heat from the house in an hour. So that's what cooling is, it's removing BTUs, okay? That's important to understand. Heating load is the opposite. So in the winter, the BTUs are concentrated inside the house and they're gonna to wanna to escape to where there's less BTUs to the outside where it's colder. So the heating load is the number of BTUs per hour that the heater, whether it's a heat pump or a furnace, has to replace or has to add into the house in order to maintain a constant temperature, okay? And again, this can be calculated for a home. You look at the wall areas, the, how much insulation is in it. You have dual pane windows, single pane windows, metal frame windows. You add up all that heat transfer for certain design conditions, and you can calculate the heating and cooling load. And then obviously those two numbers are very important for picking an appropriate heat pump or heater to meet those loads, okay? So heating is a process of adding BTUs. That's pretty straightforward, okay? And let's say you have a heater that's tested to have 30,000 30, BTUs per hour capacity. That means it can add 30,000 kitchen matches worth of heat to the house in an hour. So to maintain a constant temperature inside 
inside the house, you've got, you've got B2s that are escaping and you have to replace those. If you want the temperature to remain constant inside the house, the rate at which they're leaving has to be um, counteracted, if you will, by, by the amount of BTUs that are being put in. Put in. So the, the heat coming in has to equal the heat leaving in order to maintain a constant temperature, okay? So capacity is the ability of the heating equipment to provide heat uh, or cooling, okay? It's rated in BTUs per hour. And think of it as the supply. It's what you get from the equipment, okay? And then the load of the house is a calculated number, and it's how much heating or cooling the house needs. So think of that as the demand. So you've got supply from the equipment and the demand of the house. Good equipment sizing is the ability to match the equipment's supply to the house's demand. You don't want to be too big, and you don't want to be too small. Okay, there's a there's a kind of a nice sweet spot in the middle there that that um, makes sure that a house will be comfortable and energy efficient. So undersizing is a term you'll hear. Undersizing is defined as when the capacity of the equipment is less than the load of the house. So the equipment basically can't keep up. The demand is greater than the supply. And so that would be a situation where your heater was too small for the house on a really cold day. It just can't warm up the house, okay? And opposite's true for the, for the uh, air conditioners. Oversizing is defined as when the capacity of the equipment is much too big for the, for the demand of the house. So your supply is much greater than the demand. Um, this can actually cause comfort issues as well, and it's less energy efficient. So like I said, there's a fine line. You don't wanna to be too big and you don't wanna to be too small. You don't wanna be oversized and you don't wanna be undersized. Now, design conditions are specified by code. You're not supposed to mess around with those, okay? But contractors have a bad habit of doing that. Uh, you're supposed to use the design temperature specified by code and they're, they're picked for a reason. Um, and there's um, temperatures for the inside of the house and there's temperatures for the outside of the house. And then there's summer design temperatures and winter design temperatures, okay? And a lot of people are a little thrown off by the, um, the outdoor design temperatures and they'll look at them and say, well, that's not the coldest day I remember it being. And it's, it's not designed for the coldest day. You don't want to design for the coldest day and you don't want to design for the hottest day. It's um, for cooling, we're designing to what's called the one percentile, which means 1% of the time, it's actually hotter than that number, okay? And then there's another number we use for heating. So here's some examples here. There's this huge table uh, that, that's uh, specified by code. Um, it has all the cities in California. If you're, if you're not within a, like a city zone or, or you know, within the city boundaries, um, you'll pick the closest city. Um, and you are, if you are not within a city and you might be in a microclimate, you are allowed to adjust the, the temperatures, but you have to get permission uh, from the local jurisdiction to do that, okay? Um, <clears throat> the, what's really important to understand is, is most people only worry about whether their air conditioner or heater is gonna work on the most extreme days. Is the heater gonna work on a really cold day? Is the heater gonna work on a really hot day? What they forget is that's a very, very small portion of the time. And your system needs to work at milder conditions. It needs to work on, we call those the shoulder conditions or the shoulder season or the, the milder days, things like that. And what happens is if you size for too extreme of a temperature on those mild days, the system will be way oversized and you'll actually have comfort issues on the mild days, which seems kind of weird, um, but, it, but it's true. Um, if an air conditioner is oversized, it does what's called short cycling. It, it turns on and off too quick. Um, you never reach the full capacity of the equipment. You never reach the full efficiency of the equipment. And it blows really cold air. And you get, it, it makes stratification within the house worse and things like that. So oversizing is actually a bigger problem than undersizing in terms of, com of comfort complaints, okay? And energy efficiency at the same time. So don't, it's, it's human nature to want to kind of round up a size just to be safe on your equipment. You should actually be doing the opposite. You'd be looking for opportunities to round down a size and, and have your system um, actually be smaller, um, and which is more appropriately sized to the, to the load calculation. And another thing too is the load calculations are, are, are sort of by, it's very commonly known that load calculations are actually higher than what they really are in the house. I guess you'd say they're playing it safe 
Um, there's some safety factors built into the load calculations. Um, and, and then and then people get nervous and then add another safety factor on top of that and then round up to the next size and the next thing you know, your equipment's too big and you're having comfort complaints and people think it's, oh, I, it's, I must have undersized it. And then they make it bigger the second time. And so it, it, it evolves for equipment to get bigger and bigger, but it, it, we're trying very hard to encourage people to go the other direction, okay? Chances are, by the way, uh, the vast majority of homes in California um, are the equipment's already oversized. And, and, and so when you, when you have the opportunity to reevaluate the size of your equipment, you really should take that opportunity, okay? Okay, super basic thermodynamics and the refrigeration cycle. Hopefully I, I don't put anybody to sleep with this, um, but um, it's, it's good to understand because it's very important when it comes to understanding heat pumps and how they work and why they're so efficient, okay? So temperature. Temperature is basically the measurement of the density of BTUs within a volume, whether it's a house or a jar or a cup of water or something like that. It's how many BTUs you have within a certain volume. Okay, that's what temperature is. So something that is cooler has less BTUs in it than something that's warmer. That seems pretty intuitive, okay? But what you have to realize too is that everything has BTUs in it. Even a, even a block of ice has heat in it, has BTUs in it. The only place that does not have any heat is the vacuum of space, <laughs> okay? So everything has some BTUs in it. It's just that the colder things it's they're less dense than than the warmer things. Okay. So when we heat something, like I said, we're adding heat in those that's that's rated in BTUs per hour. Um, when you add BTUs to something, the temperature goes up because you're increasing the density of the BTUs within that space by adding BTUs to the BTUs that are already there. Okay. That seems fairly intuitive. Cooling is the opposite. It's negative BTUs per hour. So you're removing heat from something. And as you remove those BTUs, they become less dense and the temperature goes down, okay? So if you remove BTUs at the same rate that they're being added, the temperature will remain constant, okay? So in a house, either the BTUs are, are naturally leaving at a certain rate and we're adding them back in at the same rate to maintain a constant temperature. And by the way, that rate changes because the outdoor temperature changes. So your equipment has to have the ability to cycle on and off in order to, otherwise it just keeps adding and adding and adding. And then if it's not as cold outside, you, you start overheating inside the house. So it's this, it's this fine balance that we have to maintain in order to keep a constant temperature inside the house. So um, BTUs naturally move from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. So if you have a block of say block of metal and it's warm and you have another block of metal and it's cold and you put those two in contact, the BTUs are gonna move from the more dense to the less dense. So they're gonna move from the warmer block to the colder block. And that's gonna, that's gonna continue to do that until they equalize, until they both become the same temperature. And then there's, the heat doesn't have really any place to go, okay? This is a very simplistic form of what we call the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that heat will always move from warmer to colder uh, temperatures. And it's just, it's just natural, it just does it on its own. Now, this is, this is really interesting. If you take a volume that has a certain number of BTUs in it and you reduce that volume, you're condensing those BTUs into a smaller space and they become more dense, which means the temperature goes up, okay? That's why if you've ever noticed or ever heard of when they fill uh, scuba tanks with air and they're pumping air into a tank, um, they have to submerge it into a cold water bath to, to keep it cool. Otherwise it overheats because they're putting more and more air into a small volume and the, the BTUs are becoming more dense and they have to remove those out, okay? So the same number of BTUs in a bigger volume is gonna be cooler than the same number of BTUs in a smaller volume, okay? Now, if we have a compressible gas in a container that you can make smaller and bigger, you can actually change the temperature of that gas by changing the volume of the space, all right? So if you um, expand that volume and it gets cold and it happens to be colder than the air around it, then the heat's gonna naturally wanna come into that container. So in this image here, you, you can see it's 70 degrees inside a house, let's say, and you've got a volume of, of air and you expand that volume, make the volume bigger, 
and it has so it makes the BTUs less dense, then that volume gets cold. And as I mentioned in the second law of thermodynamics, heat is going to want to go from the warmer to the colder. So it's going to go from the warmer air at 70 into the container that's only 40. Okay. So you're creating a temperature difference by changing the volume of this container. And the opposite is true. If you compress that volume and you make it compress it so much that it becomes hotter than the surrounding air, those BTUs are going to want to leave. So you can actually change the direction of heat flow by making this volume larger and smaller. Okay, and then the the it changes the temperature relative to the air around it. So it goes above the temperature, heat comes out, you, you compress it. The heat comes out and you expand it and the heat goes in. So it's almost like a heat sponge. You're, you're absorbing and expelling heat by changing the volume of this container. Okay? So the ability to mechanically change the temperature of a fluid or gas by changing its volume is very important to understanding air conditioning and refrigeration. That's how the refrigeration cycle works. Now, a refrigerant like the old term is Freon, um, R22, R410A, and things like that. Those are very special gases that when you change the volume, not only does it change the temperature, but it changes the state. It changes it from a gas to a liquid. And when that happens, it, it makes the ability to absorb and expel heat that much better. Okay? It just works 10 times better than just saying doing gas or, or air that, that doesn't change state. Okay, So let's say we have a house. It's 70 degrees inside the house and it's 90 degrees outside. Okay. The BTUs are naturally coming into the house because it's warmer outside. And the and second law of thermodynamics says heat travels, travels from warmer to colder. So heat's coming into the house. Okay. And if we let that continue, eventually the house is going to become 90 degrees, but we want to keep it at 70 degrees. So we take our little container and we bring it inside the house and we expand it. So the air, the temperature inside the container is 40 and we absorb some BTUs, okay? And then we take it outside and we squeeze it and then we dump the BTUs to the outside. And if we just keep doing that, absorb it, squeeze it out, absorb it, squeeze it out, absorb it, squeeze it out, we can actually pump BTUs out of the house. And if we can do that at the same rate that they're coming in, we can maintain a constant temperature inside the house, okay? So uh, we have basically just mechanically moved BTUs in the opposite direction that they want to go. They want to come into the house and we've, we've made them go in the opposite direction. Um, we've moved them from a cooler inside to a warmer outside. All right. And here's a spoiler alert. We can go the other way too. If it's colder outside than it is inside, we can actually move BTUs in the opposite direction that they want to go. And we can replace those BTUs at the same rate that they're escaping and maintain a constant temperature in the wintertime, just like we can in the summertime. Okay. So that's super basic uh, refrigerant cycle, but that's not exactly how air conditioners work. We don't have this container of gas that we're expanding and contracting and expanding, running it inside, running it outside, running it inside. They figured out a much better system to do that. And it's basically a continuous loop. It's a pipe that's, that goes in between the inside and the outside of the house. And inside this pipe, there is compressed gas and there's expanded gas. And so, um, it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like a conveyor belt of these little sponges that these little heat sponges that I just showed you. Um, it's kind of like a conveyor belt within this within this pipe. Okay, so on the inside of the house, the gas expands. It goes through something called an orifice, and then it expands and gets very very cold. It absorbs the heat inside the house. Okay, and then that gas circulates through. And these these little squiggly lines here are what we call coils, and that's just a way to make the refrigerant come in contact with air. That's those, those fins you see like on the radiator on a car. It's, that's designed to um, extract heat from air or put heat into air by, by increasing the surface area uh, that the air comes in contact with. All right, so, the, air, so the, the refrigerant absorbs heat from the house and then it goes outside. And then outside in your condenser, uh, in, your, you know, in your yard, if you know where that is, um, the big unit with the fan on top of it. Inside that box, there's a compressor that's then squishing that gas back into a liquid, and that makes it very hot. And so we're blowing outside air over this hotter liquid, and that, and then that, um, those BTUs then go out into the air. 
So it's a way to move BTUs against the direction that they want to go with this loop, okay? This loop of refrigerant. So we can do that with an air conditioner, but we can also do that in the other direction. See, we're used to air conditioners. Air conditioners have been doing this for years and years and years. We've had air conditioners. It's a very, you know, very well, <laughs> well-rounded science. We've been doing it for a long time, but it's only been, uh, it's been a while, but it's only been the last few years that this has become very popular for reasons we'll talk about in a minute is to go the other direction. And so you can actually take that air conditioner and with something called a reversing valve, you can make that refrigerant go the other direction. And on a cold day, it makes the refrigerant colder than the outside air. So it's gonna absorb BTUs from the air. And then on the inside of the house, it's going to expel the BTUs. You make the, you make the, the, the gas hotter than the air inside the house and it'll heat the air inside the house, okay? Same thing, opposite direction of the heat flow. All right, so what exactly is a heat pump? This thing that we call a heat pump? Well, a heat pump is an electric heater, okay? But rather than creating electricity, like an electric resistance heater, um, like uh, you know the heating elements in a blow dryer, um, the little space heaters that you plug in, and they start to hum and you see the wires glowing orange and stuff like that, that's electric resistance heat. That's taking electricity and converting electricity directly to heat. And they're very efficient at that. Electric resistance heaters are very efficient. In fact, they're about 100% efficient. For every unit of electricity you put into that unit, you get 100 units of heat out of it, okay? Very efficient. The problem is that electricity is expensive, okay? So why are heat pumps so efficient? Well, heat pumps actually take electricity and instead of creating heat from the electricity, it's moving heat that already exists. It's taking heat from the air and moving it inside the house simply by compressing this gas from a gas to a liquid, okay? And as it turns out, it takes much less electricity to move heat than it does to create it, about one third roughly, okay? So that's why heat pumps are so efficient is that they're, they're not creating heat, they're, they're, they're stealing heat from the air that's already, that's, that's there, the B2s that are already there. Um, and so that's what makes them so efficient. So the advantages of heat pumps for space heating. Um, as I said, air conditioners have been around for a long time, since the 30s. They're a proven technology. Um, air conditioners move heat from a colder inside of the house to the hotter outside. So they're extracting BTUs from the house uh, that are coming in from the outside. Heat pumps are just air conditioners that run backwards. They, they extract heat from the cold air, they compress it, and they put it into the house and, and heat the house by moving BTUs from the cold air to the inside, okay? All right, so heat pumps are basically air conditioners that run backwards in the wintertime. Uh, Christine, do we have uh, questions that I need to address yet? Um, there are a couple. Um, one was where do we find the table of heating conditions for California cities that you reference uh, the design temps? Yes, so maybe that, you can answer, do you wanna yes. address that? I sure can. It's called Reference Appendix JA2. <laughs> Reference Appendix JA2. Um, it can be found on the California Energy Commission website. I'm pretty sure if you just Google that, Reference Appendix JA2, um, capital J, capital A, dash two. Um, I'm pretty sure it'll come up that way too. And it's it's uh, there's like 500 cities on that, California cities on that list. Okay. Um, the second question is, what is stratification? Ah, strat good question. Yes, stratification is basically um, warm air rising and cold air falling, okay? Warm air is less dense than cold air, and so it's going, and cold air is more dense, and so it's going to want to settle to the bottom, and, and warm air is going to want to rise to the top. And stratification is basically when you've got warmer temperatures up high and, and cooler temperatures down low. That can be within a room. It'll be it'll be colder at the floor than it is at the ceiling. But the most obvious place that you see that is in a two-story house. Um, the house will stratify, and the warm air will go upstairs, and the cold air will settle to the bottom. And you get hot upstairs and cold downstairs. Okay, so it's just temperature difference, a vertical um, a vertical difference in temperature caused by de the difference in density of the air. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, got all that. Okay. So a lot of people say, well, how, how cold can it be before a heat pump stops working? 
All right. Well, what's how cold is the coldest freezer you have? Do you have a chest freezer out in your garage or um, the freezer in your refrigerator? How cold is that? Well, that's however cold that is. That's actually a heat pump and it's working in that how cold that is, um, it'll still work. So um, um, your heat pump is basically, uh, or your, sorry, your freezer is basically a heat pump extracting heat from a very, very cold space and putting it outside. So if, if your refrigerator and freezer can extract heat from, from the, that cold, cold box and put it outside, a heat pump can extract heat from the outside of the house and put it inside the house, even when it's really, really cold outside, okay? Heat pumps are being successfully installed in some of the coldest regions in the world. Heat pump technology has improved a lot over the years. There's new types of heat pumps that work in much colder temperatures. So um, there's people here at the conference from Minnesota that have heat pumps in their house and um, Canada, uh, people all over the country. Uh, Michigan have heat pumps uh, where it gets really, really cold. Um, and for the Bay Area, the Bay Area is ideal. Yeah. It's an ideal climate for heat pumps. It's mild. It has, it's not super cold in the winter. It's not super hot in the summer. It's a perfect location to use heat pumps, okay? Now, a lot of people are concerned that, well, what if the heat pump doesn't keep up for some reason? Well, in, in a lot of places, they will put electric resistance backup strips or supplementary heating on there for extra cold nights, not needed in, in our climate, okay? Heat pump electric resistance strips are not necessary in our climate. You can put them on for emergencies, but they shouldn't be a supplemental heat. The, the, heat. the heating capacity of the heat pump by itself will handle the heating load of the house, okay? Uh, but you can put them on for, for emergency purposes if you want to, but if you properly size your heat pump, they should never run. The heat, the heat strips should never run. Another advantage of heat pumps is they're just safer than gas furnaces, okay? There's no gas being, there's no explosive gas being pumped into your house. Um, when gas burns, it gives off poisonous gases. We don't have that. And there's no fire hazards associated with, with heat pumps like there are with, with gas furnaces. If you open your old gas furnace and you look inside and you see all these wires and probes and sensors and stuff like that, those are, 90% of those are safety features, okay? To prevent fire, to prevent backdrafting, to prevent, prevent um, gases from coming into the house. Uh, and the potential for something to go very, very wrong with a gas furnace is so high that they passed a code a long time ago that if you, that if you do anything in your house, they want you to put a carbon monoxide detector in your house because they've, too many people don't have them and it's very common for something to go wrong with gas burning appliances and, and people get sick and, and sometimes die in course. So, so the CO detectors are, are pretty much standard to be required if you even put in a sink in your house, they, they'll say you have to put in a CO detector as part of that work, okay? That's just kind of give you an indication that there's something amiss when, when you see that. Um, the other advantages of heat pump is they're actually simpler and cheaper to install because you don't have to worry about gap, running gas pipes to the house. Um, there's no flu vents penetrating the roof. Um, there's no combustion air vents where you have to let oxygen somehow get to that flame so that it'll burn correctly. Um, you don't have to worry about all that. It's just a, it's a box and you just run electricity to it and it pretty much goes. Um, and it's a lot lower maintenance too. Um, combustion appliances have to be checked regularly. The gas burner ports become uh, clogged and dirty. Those are constantly needed to be cleaned out. Um, there's no safety devices that have to fail and be checked all the time. Um, there's a lot of, in, inside furnaces, there's a lot of these little rubber tubes that are measuring pressures. And those tubes leak, they, they get cracks in them over time. And then the, that pressure sensor uh, stops working and it just shuts your furnace off because it's dangerous at that point. Um, so you don't have to worry about that with heat pumps. Um, and then um, for high efficiency gas furnaces, um, one of the products of, of burning gas is water. And, and so you have to do something that that water, you have to have condensate lines and things like that. Okay? We just don't have to worry about that stuff. All right, let's see here. Um, I do need to pick up the pace a little bit. So uh, another advantage of heat pumps is they come in smaller sizes as houses get more and more efficient and, and smaller houses are being built like ADUs, heat pumps come in much si smaller sizes than gas furnaces. And so you have a more appropriate piece of equipment for smaller loads and smaller buildings. Uh, and they're cleaner, okay? Heat pumps are just cleaner. Uh, there's no carbon emissions from the heat pump itself. 
uh, in, then depending on where your power comes from, um, you, there's a lot of renewable sources out there and the grid's getting better in terms of being more energy efficient, or sorry, um, more uh, re relying less on greenhouse gases. And if you have solar on your house, you can certainly take advantage of that too. They're super efficient, I mentioned that, because they're moving heat instead of creating heat. Um, and they're very cost effective. They're, they are so cost effective now that they, they can actually compete with gas in terms of uh, cost effectiveness in, in most um, utilities. So the disadvantages of heat pumps, the equipment is, is more complicated in terms of controls and motors and, and things like that. They're not safety devices, but they're things to make it more efficient. And so it does require a, a higher skilled technician to work on them. Uh, and the controls are a little more complicated too. They, they behave a little differently than a gas furnace. So you have to be more conscious about how they're operated and how they're controlled and how you operate the thermostat and, and things like that. They can also be impacted by bad design. Um, one of the, I mentioned installed capacity. One of the things that affects installed capacity is how much airflow is passing through the ductwork, um, where the system is located in terms of temperature and things like that. And so if you don't do a good design on a heat pump, it's, it's likely not to work as well. And so in order for heat pumps to work well, they have to be carefully sized. They, the, the capacity has to be carefully determined. The airflow has to be good for it. So you have to have good duct designs and things like that. So designers just have to be more careful in how they design a heat pump system. Another uh, potential um, disadvantages is, is grid reliability issues. As more people are using more electricity, there's more demand on the grid. But the good news is, is it's getting better every day. And you know what they say is that the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. Um, and so even though there's going to be some growing pains, if you're considering um, switching out, it, now's the time to do it because that system is going to last a long time and, and the grid is getting better and you don't want to have to switch, you know, be, to, to do the right thing when, you're, when your system's not uh, as old as it, as it could be, okay? So now's the time to do it. Making houses more efficient so that they work uh, with smaller equipment also reduces the demand on the grid. So one of the things I always tell people is while you're changing out your equipment, also make your house more efficient and you can probably get away with a much smaller piece of equipment um, than you would otherwise. And that helps a lot too. Um, the other disadvantage is it might require an upgraded electrical panel. Uh, one of the presentations here at the conference I'm at was about how to optimize um, your electrical panel so that you don't have to upgrade it. There's some interesting technologies out there um, um, that, can, that can help you maybe maintain the, the size of your panel. But even so, even if you do have to, there's a lot of rebates out there to help you pay for those costs to, to upgrade your electrical panel. All right, all the dis disadvantages that I mentioned are avoidable by good design, good practice, uh, or they're improving over time, like improving the, the where our electricity comes from and things like that. So things are getting better. All right, so let's talk about some different types of heat pumps. Heat pumps um, come in a lot of different configurations. Uh, ducted split system heat pumps have been around for a long time, okay? They look, when you look at them, they look like a regular gas furnace. Um, but you'll see there's no gas line going to it. There's no flue vents uh, and things like that. Um, they've been around for a long time. Um, I had lived in a house that had one for a long time back in the 80s. Um, and instead of a furnace, they have something called a fan coil unit, which is a, has a big fan in it, which is what pushes the air through the, through the ducts. And the coil, the evaporator coil, is incorporated into that box. Okay. Then the, the ones that are kind of the, the cool thing these days that you're, that you're seeing a lot of are called mini splits, okay? They, they have a much smaller condenser. We call that a suitcase style condenser. The fan is, is, is blowing on a horizontal axis as opposed, I'll go back a slide, to the more typical um, outdoor condenser with the fan in the top for, for basic air conditioners, okay? They're smaller. Um, they come in a um, single head or multi-head, so one condenser can actually serve multiple heads within the house. Um, this here is, a, is an example of a single head ducted mini split. So there's a little box that has a fan in it and the ducts come off of it. There's a return duct and supply ducts, okay? Very common. Um, these have actually, they're, 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 they seem fairly new to the United States, but they've actually been around uh, in other countries for decades. 
um, ductless mini splits. So, so this is a ducted mini split, and then there's ductless mini splits. And it's just a, a, a unit that mounts on the wall. The air goes in the bottom, comes out the top cold or warm. Um, and they, they, they work very well. Uh, one of the disadvantages is, is they only heat and cool the room that they're in. Uh, if you want air to go to some of the smaller rooms around the house, that's a better opportunity to run ducts to those if you want more even distribution. But if you have a little ADU or, or a big room and you just want to heat and cool that room by itself and handle the rest of the house some other way, it's a great, it's a great opportunity to do that. Okay. And they, there's different kinds. This is a wall cassette down here, probably the more common kind. They actually have ceiling cassettes that are kind of flush mounted into the ceiling. Um, and again, you can have multi heads. So you can have one condenser that actually serves multi units okay, within the house. So very common, um, very popular right now. A lot of people are installing these. Um, and, and if installed correctly and designed correctly, they work great. They work really well. Um, and then um, where, do, where does the heat pump get their BTUs? Most heat pumps are what we call air source heat pumps and they're getting their BTUs from the air. But there's actually um, some other ones where they, where they get heat or get, they get the BTUs from the water, uh, like a lake or a stream or something like that. Water has very dense BTUs in it um, and you can extract those BTUs and you can also pull BTUs straight from the ground. You may have heard of geothermal heat pumps where they run, they, they bury pipes under the ground and those pipes are, are basically getting heat from the ground. And that's a great source of heat. There's lots and lots of heat uh, in the ground. All right, how do you size heat pumps? Um, this, is, this is a very complicated issue and this is where people get into a lot, of, a lot of trouble. Heat pumps need to be sized correctly, okay? Heat pumps provide both heating and cooling from a single box, the, the compressor condenser box. That one unit provides heating and cooling. So you don't get a lot of choices between mixing and match, matching your capacity. Like if you have a separate furnace, you can get different size furnaces and match that with a different size air conditioner. Well, a heat pump does both. So the, the relationship between the heating and cooling capacity is fixed. And depending on your climate, um, you could have, you know, uh, it could be fine for your air conditioning, but too small for your heating or, or fine for your heating and too small for your air conditioner or something like that. So there's a limitation there. So you have to be more thoughtful in how you size your equipment. And, and don't ever forget that you can always change the load of your house. You can always improve your house to make it different. Okay. So if, if it seems like a heat pump doesn't fit, you should always consider change the house, change the load. Don't always focus on the supply, the capacity of the equipment. Also think about the ability to, to change the demand of the house. So um, in terms of sizing equipment, you're probably not gonna do it yourself. You're probably gonna hire a professional to do that. You can hire a, a, an independent designer, like an engineer or somebody like that, who that's what they do. But most likely the contractor who's installing the equipment will do the design. Be sure to hire a qualified licensed contractor that understands the design process, okay? The residential HVAC design process is spelled out by these three manuals, okay? ACA is Air Conditioning Contractors of America. We call them ACA. ACA Manual J, Manual S, and Manual D are the three manuals that are most important to designing equipment, uh, residential HVAC systems. Manual J does the load calculation. That's figuring out how much, how much uh, uh, B2s are entering or leaving the house. Manual S tells you how to pick a piece of equipment that will match that load. And then manual D is how to design ducts to have good airflow and good air balance throughout the house, okay? Uh, just so you know, manual S is being revised as we speak. I'm, I'm helping out with that actually. Uh, but, and by the end of the year, a new manual S will be out and it spends a lot more pages on heat pumps, okay? It has a lot more um, alternative heat pump sizing opportunities uh, in the new manual S. Now, historically, the way they did it um, is they would just calculate the heating load and the cooling load, and they would size the heat pump to the cooling load to make sure that the house cooled properly. And if it, if it wasn't big enough for heating, they would just throw some resistance electric strips on there to make up the difference. Well, we don't want that anymore. Electric resistance strips use too much energy, too much electricity. And so we, we, we've changed the way we size heat pumps uh, over the years. So research, field studies, and improvements in heat pump 
technology itself um, all show that we no longer need heat strips in California. Um, heat pumps are working fine in all climates in California, even Tahoe and Truckee. There's heat pumps up there with no heat strips that are working just fine. The generally recommendation, the, the generally accepted uh, procedure for sizing heat pumps today is you size the heat pump to the larger of the heating or cooling load, okay? And um, then it might be a little oversized for the other load. So you could size it for cooling and it might be a little big for heating, that's fine. You can size it for heating and if it's a little big for cooling, that's fine too. I mentioned earlier that oversizing equipment can cause comfort complaints, but those can be resolved with good duct design and a little better quality heat pump that throttles down in the mild days, okay? We call that variable capacity or two-stage heat pumps. And what those do is in, instead of being one speed and be oversized part of the time, they're able to throttle down and reduce down their capacity so that they're not oversized on the milder days, okay? So as long as your heat pump heating capacity is properly sized to handle the heating load without heat strips, the heat strips should never come on. You shouldn't need them, all right? You can install them as emergency heat uh, in case we have a, you know, uh, what if the uh, polar vortex or something like that should hit California? Um, you can you can use them as as backup strips, okay? But what we're finding is a lot of contractors are putting them in and eventually disconnecting them because they just never get used. Um, and then a lot of times, um, you know, a lot of utilities will recommend that you have setups and setback temperatures for your for your um, air conditioner and heater. Uh, it turns out that that's not the best best idea for heat pumps. Um, you, you really wanna set it at a constant temperature and just let it run. You can bump it up a little bit, bump it down a little bit, but don't you know set it back five or six degrees at night and then because then it has to recover in the morning. Um, one of the most common problems with new heat pump systems is that the installers are not familiar with the controls. They're, a lot of installers are used to installing old style equipment and they get these fancy new units in there and they're, they're not super experienced with them. And um, there's a lot of little knobs and settings that have to be set very precisely for them to work to work at. Um, and so that's probably one of the biggest complaints we're having right now is, is the installers just, they just they're, not reading the, they're not reading the instructions quite as well as they should. Um, and so just be patient. Um, a lot of times installers will have to come back and make some adjustments as they learn. And so we need to be patient with them uh, as they get more experience and eventually, you know, they'll get, they'll get better and better at it. So just you know, be a little patient with some of the installers, understanding that this is new, new technology. Just like when, when all this new stuff came out in cars with anti-lock brakes and all this, this other stuff, you know, car mechanics had a hard time catching up with that stuff. So it's kind of the same thing. There's going to be some growing pains. Um, but there are some really, really good installers out there who actually have been doing this a long time. It's just now that everyone else has to do it, um, you're, you're seeing more inexperienced installers. So be patient with them. Okay. That's the end of the presentation. Looks like we got a bunch of questions here. And it looks oh, like- Oh, good, have because I, I have them all. Um, there's a lot of questions. So Great. Um, one first question that I'm going to consolidate a few of them is how to find a good contractor, um, a good heat pump contractor. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pass this off to you, but I also have a comment about that too. So I'd like to have you take it. Yeah, they, um, you know, well, for, for rebates, there are a lot of times, and I know Bayron has a list of approved contractors that you should work from. Um, you want to make sure that they are familiar with the design process, that they that they regularly do load calculations and design the manual JSD that I talked about. And then I would also recommend working with contractors that also understand home performance. And what that means is they don't just deal with the equipment, that they also are experienced dealing with the house, making the house better. There, you know, there's a there's a there's a term in the industry, the house is a system. And so a home performance contractor will, will try to reduce the load of the house as well as install equipment. And so that would be my recommendation. You want to have contractors that have equipment like blower doors and duct blasters and flow hoods and things like that, the diagnostic equipment. That's always a really good sign too. 
So I just want to mention um, through the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, uh, the financing program that we administer in our office, we maintain a real robust searchable database of contractors. And um, while we cannot ever recommend contractors, we're a county organization, um, it's what we do recommend is consistent with the contractor state license board is to solicit a minimum of three bids. And um, so I can put that link to the contractor database in the chat. But as Russ mentioned, if you did want to um, become eligible for a Bay Ren incentive, you would need to cross check and make sure that they were also Bay Ren uh, contractors. The Bay Ren link will be included in the slides. The Skype link is also included in the slides, but I'll, I'll put the direct link to the contractor search tool in there for you. Um, so let's see, I'm poised to buy a three ton heat pump for a 1300 square foot home with two 12K BTU mini splits and one, so that sounds like three indoor units. Um, I have double pane windows, so-so insulation. I say upgrade that so-so insulation right away. And then, um, does three tons seem like overkill? It does. It does to me. Yes, it really does. Um, there, there was an old, old rule of thumb of 500 square feet per ton. Um, so 1,500 square foot would be three tons, um, and that's that's an old rule of thumb. Um, if you do anything to your house to improve it, uh, you you can get by with a lot less than that. So I would highly recommend uh, getting a, a a load calculation done on the house, a room by room load calculation, so that you know you know what the different loads are for the different three heads that you're doing as well. That does seem big to me. So um, you already um, kind of addressed this contractor comments, but I wanted to know if you had any um, questions that folks should be asking contractors um, to be able to understand if they actually know what they're doing. And I know you mentioned home performance contractors, but is there any mm -hmm. advice that you have for that? Yeah, just ask them, you know, how long they've been installing heat pumps and had they installed many before. You obviously don't want to be the guinea pig that's the first one or even the second or third one. You want a contractor that's, that's done a few of them and has experience with it. Um, and because it's always a learning process. Um, and then um, there's ACCA, ACCA also has something called the Quality Installation Checklist. Um, that's, a good, that's a good reference document. Um, it, I think it's called QI standard number five, and it has a whole list of questions you can ask a contractor um, mm. to see. And then also when they install the equipment, um, it's a checklist to see, make sure they do certain things in the, in the commissioning process. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I just want to say, um, respect everybody's time. We know we're at a, we're past time, a couple minutes. Um, we, if you, if it's okay with you, Russ, I wouldn't mind addressing more of these questions, but if you're available. Yep, no problem. Okay, no cool. Problem. So um, just hang in there, you guys, and we'll try and get to all your questions. Um, what are the maintenance requires requirements of a heat pump? Um, it, not that much, actually. Once, it, once it's installed and running well, um, you know, the hardest part is getting the proper refrigerant charge in it and getting all the control set and everything. And once it's running well, it's kind of like your refrigerator. You just, you know, you got to keep the coils clean and change your filters and stuff like that. And it'll just go and go. Um, so it's it's substantially less than say a gas furnace or something like that. Can heat pump technology be integrated with existing heating and AC systems? It can, yeah. If you have an existing, uh, let's say you have a ducted uh, gas furnace with an air conditioning on it, um, I I see a question here about hybrid systems too. Yeah, that just um, came. Or in. or what they call dual fuel systems. So if you remember the diagram that had the the fan coil unit. Um, it looks just like a furnace and you can actually use your furnace to be the fan coal unit for a heat pump system. And then the heating of the gas furnace um, is like your backup heat. And so it'll run on, on the heat pump mode most of the time. And if it's sized correctly, it should run on it all the time and use the gas furnace as the air handler. Um, and, and then you can use the same ducts and everything else too. But I would also... I would encourage you to consider downsizing if, if at all possible. Um, like I said, most systems in California are oversized. And so if you're, if you're going to change out the system, oh, most equipment is oversized, but the ducts are undersized. And so putting in smaller equipment will make it matched better to the, to the existing duct system. So it's very often that you can downsize the equipment and get better airflow because the ducts are bigger relative to the equipment. If that makes sense, okay. But yes, you can you can utilize some of the existing stuff. 
um, in your house. So I think you, I'm going to just address this question, but not, I think we've already heard your address, you address this, is retrofitting older homes with gas and duct work going to be discussed? Maybe they mean um, existing gas equipment for, mm -hmm. and, and existing duct work. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can convert a central gas system to a central heat pump system and utilize a lot of the same equipment, the same duct you can actually use the furnace as your as your air handler. But if you're trying to get gas out of your house for safety reasons and things like that, um, you might as well just pull the furnace out um, and then put in a put in a um, uh, a fan coil unit. But um, you can utilize the same ducts. You, you're going to have to get them. Make sure they get sealed because a lot of existing ducts are very leaky. Um, and um, it's always good to just sort of redesign the system and and see if you can identify any potential places where the ducts might be undersized. Uh, a lot of times the return, the return ducts are much smaller than they should be, uh, but you can you can utilize a lot of the existing duct. Sure. So um, there are a couple of questions related to this, so I'll just kind of combine them. Mm -hmm. um, can a heat pump be used to replace a gas furnace in a hydronic heating system? Um, it, yes, <laughs> um, not, in a, not, not in a radiant floor system. Well, I mean, you can heat, so there's heat pump water heaters. OK, and so a hydronic system uses hot water to heat, uh, heat the space. And so you can have a heat pump water heater that provides hot water to a fan coil and blows air across a coil. You can use a heat pump water heater to heat radiant floors. And I think one of the questions asked about cooling through radiant floors, that's very uncommon. There are a few kind of unusual systems where you can actually cool a house with floors. Um, but you're going to you're going to heat the house with the floors and then you're probably going to have to have a ducted uh, air conditioning system in it on top of that. And, and this is one of those um, things where they're coming out with newer technologies. Um, they're kind of small little chillers that are heat pumps that um, may have the capacity to deal with both domestic hot water and um, radiant distribution. So mm -hmm. uh, the Advanced Energy Center has a couple of them on display and it's a pretty specialized um, contractor who would work with those types of co combined hydronic systems. Sure. Um, let's see, do, let's see, how, how does the power needed compare to an air conditioner, both whole house, both whole house and ducted? I'm just going to say central air conditioner. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, power? Yeah, you, you're typically going to have to um, add a larger circuit uh, on the heating side, because a, um, a gas furnace only right. needs 110 to turn the fan, uh, but a heat pump is going to need a larger um, circuit, um, a larger amp circuit. And, and so sometimes you have to change out the panel on your house and that's, that can be a big cost, but there are a lot of rebates to help offset those costs. Um, and there's also some really interesting technologies out there to, to prevent you from having to up, upsize your, um, your panel. There was a, there was a, a seminar on that yesterday. Um, but um, in air conditioning mode, it's exactly the same. When a heat pump's in air conditioning mode and a regular split system air conditioner, it's exactly the same. Um, let's see, there was a question about the, the reference appendix JA2 um, yeah. and um, what the, the, the person looked up Petaluma and next to the listing, it said FS2. Um, field, do you have any... field, yeah, field station two is what okay. FS. FS okay. is field station and AP stands for airport. And it's it's basically where where the sensors are located that they collected the data from. And then they then they tabulate all that data and then they they use some sort of statistical analysis to determine what what's sort of the perfect temperature to design to. So there are a couple of questions that are about the idea of not set no setbacks using right. not using setbacks. One is is it better to keep the temperature at a constant level and run it all day when no one's home for eight to ten hours? We've been setting it to run only a few hours in the morning and evening. Is that okay or inefficient? It's it's always better to leave it, just set it and forget it. You should run your heat pump or air conditioning system like your like your refrigerator and not like your car where you get into it and turn it on as you need it. Um, however, um, you can change the temperature a little bit. HVAC systems are designed to maintain a constant temperature. Remember we talked about matching the incoming to the outgoing heat. That's what they're designed to do. They're not designed to change temperatures. It takes a lot more energy to increase the temperature or reduce the temperature as opposed to leaving it the same. So you're better off just leaving it the same. 
Now, there's a lot of questions about setup and setback at night, and people like to like to not be as warm at night. You can set it back a little bit, but it's not like a gas furnace where it can just, you know, a gas furnace can, can just come on and blow up all this heat into the house and heat it up very quickly. Heat pumps heat slowly. And if the heat pump realizes that it's heating too slowly, it will kick into the backup electric strips and then it gets expensive and then you've lost your efficiency. So if you do have, if you do want to set it back, try to as little, the smallest amount of setback as you can, you know, just a few degrees um, and then have it return back to the, the, the daytime temperature sooner. So that it's not, doesn't have to do it all of a sudden, right before you get up. So give it a couple hours and it will slowly come back to temperature. And that might actually even be better for it to slowly come back um, then to all of a sudden just get warm, you know, right before you get up. Um, there's a question about, um, do, do these wall cassettes, the mini split, the ductless mini split with wall cassettes have venting coming through the wall? It looks like standalone without any vents or ducts. And there's a second question here that relates to um, filtration with ductless mini splits. I think those, you could kind of address both of those maybe. The the ductless so mini splits heads are, 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 they just recirculate the air. The air just gets pulled in the bottom and blown out the top. And they do have filters inside of them, um, but you don't have, you know, the, the HIPAA or the, the MERV 13 filters that you might in a, in a, in a split system. So you, you might have to have a separate air filtration system, which is it's actually, as a mechanical engineer, I, I prefer that. I, I've, I've never been a big proponent of having your heating and cooling system also be your filtration system because they run on two different things. One runs on temperature and one runs on air quality. And, you, and if you have the opportunity to have a separate air quality monitor that's controlling a filtration system, that's actually a, that's actually a, a better system to have. Um, um, but um, you can put filters in them. Um, I'm not sure if they, you know, what, how high of a MERV rating filters you can get. Um, so you, you may have to consider sort of a different um, type of filtration system, a separate filtration system. Um, there's a question here about how noisy the outside condensers are, and do they run more often than gas systems? Um, well, gas systems don't have an outdoor unit, so so you, there is that's not a fair comparison. But um, in air conditioning mode, um, it's the same. Okay as a regular system. Um, but the little, the little suitcase condensers that I mentioned are, are quite quiet um, compared to the, to the bigger ones. Um, um, and, and it varies, it varies by manufacturer. You can look at the, the sound rating, but if you have a regular, you know, central air conditioning system already, um, and you know, those big outdoor units that, that can be pretty loud, um, the new ones are much quieter than those are. Um, let's see, does a heat pump system work well with a whole house fan? I've heard those fans don't work well with central AC systems, but I assume it's different with a heat pump. So a whole house fan basically sucks in outside air and blows it out through the attic. Um, and it's just a way to exchange the outdoor air with the house very quickly. And so you only want to do that when the outdoor temperature is correct. If you want to cool your house, you turn your you turn your whole house fan on when it's colder outside, and then it will basically make the house the same temperature as outside. You don't want to turn on your whole house fan when it's hot outside. You that that will um, um, you know make the house hotter. Now your air conditioner has to run more to, to keep up with it. So it's kind of it's kind of two different things. The the heat pump your HVAC system is designed to change the temperature of the house. The whole house fan is designed to bring the outside air into the house. And so it just depends on what that temperature is as to whether it's gonna make your HVAC system work harder or not. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, someone here is asking about heat pumps in Truckee and would they be okay without heat strips? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> I was talking to some people in the conference are, are we're doing some case studies of houses that they've done up in Truckee and Tahoe and Shasta and all those really, really cold places. And um, at the first few houses they did, they were nervous that they put in the heat pumps, but didn't hook them up and expected to have to come back and hook them up and never did. So yeah, so there, it's possible. And there are, there are special heat pumps designed specifically for colder climates. Um, regarding the importance of duct design, 
Um, with that in mind, do you have an idea of range of cost for entirely new duct system, um, if that's necessary? Thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, it 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 varies greatly. It's really hard to say, and it's and even from contractor to contractor, it's going to be very greatly for the same size. But let me just say this: that um, the average house in California, the the equipment, the the furnace and air conditioner is oversized, and the ducts are undersized. So if you're going to change out your equipment try as hard as you can to put in smaller equipment so that it will be more appropriately sized for the existing ducts. And then you can utilize the existing ducts. They won't be as undersized or they might even be fine. Um, it's always good to do a, 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 do a design on a house and just see how much air you need in each room. And then you can evaluate the existing system to see whether it's gonna be appropriate or not. Um, can a heat pump be put in just one room? So I'm assuming they mean ductless, a ductless mm -hmm. indoor unit, um, yep. and use and then use the existing heat central heating and AC system. And I'm assuming just the fan to um, the forced air fan in the central system to in fan mode to circulate the air in the house. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, that is one of the things about heat pump. The, 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 the ductless systems is they heat and cool the room that they're in really, really well. And then how does that, how does that heat and cooling get to the other rooms? Um, if you have a really efficient shell, that's the key is you want the, the, the building envelope to be super efficient. And sometimes if, if it's really efficient, you, that heat will get there anyways. But if it's an older house that's got leaks in it and you know not so great windows and stuff like that, that heat is, is more likely to escape out of the, the shell before it gets back to those spaces. And so anything that can circulate that heat is, is not a bad idea, um, but you would wanna make sure that those ducts are really, really tight, that they're well sealed because by running that system, you could actually be forcing air out of the house uh, through duct leakage and things like that. But that's, that's certainly a possibility. I've heard of people just installing, you know, just, just a fan um, not, not using the existing duct system, just installing a fan that pulls air from one room and dumps it to the opposite side of the house. And then that air has to make its way back through the house to get back to the, the room that has the, the mini split in it. So yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. Would energy bills be higher right now for a heat pump versus a gas furnace since electricity is so expensive? Um, it, it can be, it depends a lot, um, but there's a lot of case studies showing um, that it's that it's a wash that what you that what you save on your gas or you know the extra electricity is about what you're going to save on gas. Um, it just depends. It depends on your um, your utility. It depends on the rate system structure that you're in. If you have an EV on your house and things like that, uh, and the cost of gas. Um, like I like where I live, I have propane, and propane is crazy expensive. And so I would save a lot of money, and I'm planning to very soon to, to put a heat pump on my house. Um, but it would be different if I had, you know, uh, PG&E uh, provided gas or something like that. But it's, it's all, it, well, an interesting thing about the California Energy Code is before they can make a code, they have to first prove that it's cost effective. And they're really, really encouraging heat pumps. Um, and they've shown that they are cost effective, which means that it's, a, that it's an equal trade-off. Uh, but it, it depends, you know, it's, it's a case-by-case -case thing, too. Um, there's a question about rebates. And so uh, what I would recommend is we're going to be sending out this slide deck um, after the presentation. Um, wait a couple of days and you should receive it. I would also reach out to our office at energy at sonoma-county.org. And that contact information will be in the slide deck. Um, and we can provide you with some information on rebates, but um, also register for that funding your improvements workshop that we had previously and then we'll send you that recording and slide deck has a bunch of great resources for um, rebates for heat pumps um, i think we're cl getting close somebody asked about a guide to installing heat pumps connecting heat pumps to solar panels because from mexico we've got somebody mm. who's um, from mexico and um, so i didn't know if you had any resources for him I don't, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there was a guy here that was um, talking about that. Um, you might start with the, the um, uh, yeah, that'd be an electrical question. I'm, I'm just not that up on electrical stuff, I'm afraid. Um, I would just Google it and see, you know, uh, maybe a solar company would have um, good information about that. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on that heat pump 
conversion from a gas furnace that you've already done, um, you will, will not be eligible for the BayREN program incentives. You need to be you need to um, have those program that installed by a Bayrin contractor, unless you happen to have a Bayrin contractor. Um, but likely, you would be eligible for the Sonoma Clean Power Incentive um, as long as you met the eligibility criteria. So again, reference the um, the slide deck for information about how to reach out to those entities. Um, there's a some there's something about can the noise by the condenser violate noise ordinances? And... Um, it's unlikely. It's unlikely. Um... It, it, it potentially could, but they're they're very quiet. I know that um, when I did a lot of designs in areas that had very strict noise ordinances, um, one of the ways we resolved that was to go to a higher efficiency system. And these are very these heat pump systems are very high efficiency, so I imagine that they're a much lower stone rating on them as well. Okay, um, in a ductless system with um, with units in three different rooms, is each unit controlled separately for temperature? It's a good question. Um, yes, sort of. <laughs> um, they're not they're not perfect. So if you have multiple heads, you can set the temperature setting for each one differently. Um, but they don't run completely independent of each other. So when the when one is calling for heating or cooling, it's going to run and the fan's going to run. But the other two will run, but just not on high speed. They'll run at a much lower speed. Um, so you have to be very careful about how you size those. We've had situations where um, even running on low speed would cause that zone that's not calling for heat to overheat. Um, but it is, they are separately controlled thermostatically. It's just that they don't shut off completely if one of them has to run. So I'm going to give you one final question and um, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, I'm considering putting in an eight zone ductless mini split. I want to use five zones for wall units and another zone for a radiant floor. Is that weird? Oh. Yeah, um, that is weird. <laughs> um, you can do, you can mit, you can mix and match um, ducted and ductless, um, but radiant is going to need hot water, and hot water is going to have to come from a heat pump water heater. It, I don't, I'm not familiar. I don't think there's any uh, multi um, multi head systems that do uh, space heating and hot water out of the same unit. Um, there might be, but I, I've I've not heard of them. And I would check in with um, the Advanced Energy Center, those two um, kind of larger air to water heat pump systems that are designed for space conditioning. They, they can be configured for combined hydronic for domestic hot water too. And there may be an opportunity to do some kind of forced air fan coil unit with the hydronic system, plus a radiant floor distribution system, but that's a pretty complicated problem and yep. you'd really need to work with a hydronic contractor who specializes in that type of system that's my two cents yep. um i think we've got it i think we're good awesome mm -hmm. <laughs> well thank you so much everyone thank you so much russ it's always a pleasure um and we'll see you next week at the heat pump water heater workshop heat same water heaters. that channel mm -hmm. same time yep. um so thanks everybody for hanging in there and um have fun in yosemite russ all right. I, I sure will. I have to. Okay. I'm going to end the webinar. Great. Take care, right. Russ. Bye. Bye-bye.